Howdy folks, Rudros here. Welcome to another Lorcana Wednesday. If you haven't already, give a little click on that like and subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything and it makes a big difference in boosting the channel forward. Your help is always appreciated. With a little over a year into Disney Lorcana and our fifth set coming to a close, I thought it would be a great time to rank the five sets we have had so far from worst to best. The criteria for this ranking is simply my personal feelings and my enjoyment for what it was like to play during these sets. Let let me know your rankings or your favorite and least favorite set in the comments down below. Thank you kindly. Number 5. Ursula's Return <laughs> so for true love. Easily my worst experience so far in Lorcana, the set 4 metagame was miserable. Bucky discard decks were an absolute slog to play against. After the more open-ended meta of set 3, this one felt like it really developed into a triangle format, where deck A beats deck B, but deck B loses to deck C, and so on. The power cards were obvious and expensive, with the rest of the set falling into the bargain bin range. Only two legends, Diablo and Sisu, were worth more than $10, as most of the others were either outright unplayable or too niche to matter. Thankfully, the Bucky errata came before too long, but the deck still caused the most amount of people I've seen quit the game. And the errata itself was a strange half measure, instead of just outright banning the card. All trading card games have a ban list, and Lurkana would benefit from that being established early on, but Ravensburger instead eroded Bucky three times over to make it so unplayable it was effectively banned anyway. This was also the set we lost Pixelborn, and the game has been worse for it ever since. Number 4. Shimmering Skies What can I say except you're welcome for the tides, the sun, the sky? While this set is better simply for not having to deal with the exact Bucky list, the meta is still very unfun to play in. There is no room for rogue or fun decks when you are getting blasted into oblivion by the same culprits. Emerald Steel feels even stronger without Bucky. You lose your best card and are even better off? Yikes! Red Blue seems to get faster and more tools each set, and the usual suspects like Steel Song, Blue Grey, and Ruby Amethyst are all hanging around to ensure you are always on your toes. The amount of nut draws you come against has been many and very frequent. Probably the saving grace for the set is that set championships were allowed to go back to best of three format over the terrible best of two. Now some stores would still run best of two, so you had to find out what that specific store was doing, but at least the option was now there. Some new tricks were added to bring back dormant decks like Daisy Deck and Chromacon for aggro, but the majority of cards from the set were still in the filler category. Number 3. The First Chapter Let me share this whole new world with you. The first chapter was an experience all on its own. If we go off the real-life struggles of playing it, it's at the absolute bottom of the list. Product was insanely overpriced and impossible to procure, so playing in person was basically out of the question. But, thanks to Pixelborn, all hope was not lost. Focusing purely on the gameplay, it was probably the most creative time in the game simply because the card pool was so tiny. Yes, Ruby Amethyst Control was untouched in the late game, but with the game so fresh and new, people were tr still trying all kinds of different cards and combinations to see what hit the mark. I still have a fondness for Magic Mirror, Ursula Power Hungry, Aladdin Heroic Outlaw, and Maleficent Dragon being played in that red-purple list. It was a good first set to establish how they thought this game might develop. Although it changed very drastically in the next set, I still have a fondness for reflecting on the simplicity of the game back then. Number 2. Rise of the Floodborn Bella? Are you happy here with me? Yes. Rise of the Floodborne added a lot to the game that I thought clashed badly with Set 1. They were very specific in Set 1 to not have instant lore gain, but they completely threw that out the window in Set 2. The Merlin Mim package completely took over the game and is still the main reason to play Purple a year later. This set introduced an insane number of powerhouse cards for every ink color that still see play today. Steel Song truly came into its own with cards like Tragic Beast, Storm Rage On, Strength of a Raging Fire. It started the seeds of the early discs 
Venice cardless with Flynn, Bucky, and Prince John. Red got some powerhouses in Tremaine, Scar, and at the time, Minnie Mouse. And Amber got one-cost Cinderella Singer, the Shift Queen, Mufasa. It also formed the foundation of the blue draw engine with Hiram, Popsicle, and the Nick Judy package. The set was a nutty jump in power compared to set one. Nothing compared to red-purple in this set. And while I personally think they went completely overboard, I cannot deny how this set pushed and defined the game going forward. The one thing this set did that was appreciated was it sped up the overall game. And while I do think it was too much too soon, I also wasn't complaining about a red-purple match taking upwards of 30 minutes. Number 1. Into the Inklands. Into the end. To my great surprise, locations were exactly what the game needed. A powerful card type that followed its own rules, they proved their worth by being immune to the majority of removal in the game, but they also had plenty of weaknesses and counters to help keep the game balanced. They felt like a genuine alternative strategy you could pursue in the game. Blue-Red finally blossomed into its own this set with the arrival of the Lucky Dime. Brooms got a decent push. Emerald, which was actually considered quite weak before this set, finally came into its own with cards like Cursed Merfolk and the two Ursulas. Piglet, Kida, Baloo, and Perdita all helped push Amber aggro, while Jafar Wheel became a deck all onto itself based on a single legendary card. Red got huge additions in Jim Hawkins and the now removal bar that's been set by Madame Medusa. And Steel got Robin Hood. And then along came Zeus. And ba-boom. Set 3 was packed with a new way to play and it felt the most open-ended out of any of the metas we have had. While there were certainly favorites, it's the closest thing to balanced I felt the game achieved in its short lifespan. Let's hope this wasn't the last time the game will be that fun to play. And of course... It was the last set with a full span of Pixelborn. R.I.P., my friend. And that's my list. Thanks so much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already to get more Disney Lorcana content. I always enjoy reading your comments. Thanks so much. And until next time, take care.